Hey, Cloudcast community, listen up. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud scale monitoring and analytics platform. Datadog was built to bring clarity to complex dynamic applications, whether they're in the cloud, on prem, in containers, or wherever you run your applications. With powerful dashboards, seamless integrations, and more than 250 technologies they can monitor, Datadog has you covered. Whether it's AWS, Azure, or Google services, your popular open source projects and products, or web security and APIs, Datadog can help you monitor them and help you collaborate around troubleshooting them and make sure they're running great. Datadog provides deep end-to-end visibility into the health and performance of modern applications. So try it yourself. Get yourself a free 14-day trial. Go to datadoghq.com slash cloudcast. That's datadoghq.com slash cloudcast to try out your free 14-day trial. And if you try it out, let them know your friends at Cloudcast sent you, and they'll send you a great, uh, wonderful, soft, awesome t-shirt with the Datadog logo on it. I wear mine all the time. So once again, that's datadoghq.com slash cloudcast. Thanks for listening, and here comes the show. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you from the massive studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, one of the things that's really top of mind for a lot of people, whether you're just reading the press or whether you are uh, on the front lines trying to make your company more secure is, you know, more and more we're seeing these these very large data breaches, whether they are uh, around credit cards or they're just around uh, data. Some of them make the news, some of them don't. Um, you know, and I know it's a topic that we haven't necessarily covered probably enough. Uh, I know a lot of people are trying to figure it out, and and this domain is moving really, really quickly. So we thought we would go out, find some folks who are really smart at this, and uh, and get to talking about it a little bit. So very excited today to welcome Adam Hunt, who is CTO and Chief Data Science, uh, Chief Data Scientist, excuse me, for Risk IQ. Adam, welcome to the show. All right. Well, thank you for having uh, having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So I want to, you know, before we kind of jump into this this uh, this heavy topic. Um, you've got a a very, very impressive background uh, from an academic and and research perspective. And then obviously you're doing some very cool things at at Risk IQ. I wonder if you could, you know, fill folks in a little bit on on some of your background and then, um, you know, kind of what your focus is and what the focus is with Risk IQ as well. Um, So my background is in in particle physics. So my my doctorate is in particle physics from Princeton. And so I worked at the LHC during the the initial uh, initial ramp up of the, the Large Hadron Collider. I was part of the the Higgs boson discovery, which is a very exciting time for particle yeah. physics throughout the world. Um, so, how did I get in this, into this space? It was it was uh, really around my skill sets. I don't have a background in security. I didn't have one at least when I when I started Risk Risk IQ five years ago. I've developed that skill set over time. Um, previously, uh, working at the LHC, I would I would uh, I was focused on collecting, aggregating, analyzing large data sets, some of the biggest data sets that that are out there. Uh, working on the on the low level um, operations level systems um, and also performing all the analysis on the on these huge data sets so I was able to take that that skill set both on the operations side uh, and on the analysis side and then apply it to uh, to where I am today yeah so that 's how I got into the space. It was purely by accident we you know uh, james Plegger, who, who was the who was our, our director of research when I was hired. Um, you know, gave me a shot and let me join as a as a research engineer um, to help the research team out building better analytics and improved detection capabilities on top of their their classic signature detection uh, methodology. Yeah, no. moved into uh, into the position of data science uh, data scientist, then chief data scientist, and now now here I am as as CTO at Risk IQ. Yeah, no, it's very cool when uh, when folks kind of come from, um, yeah, I'll call sort of non-traditional backgrounds in terms of computer science, but, you know, you start to think about the complexities we're dealing with, uh, the amount of information we're dealing with. And so, you know, having the background that you do in terms of, uh, you know, like you said, really, really big data sets, um, you know, how to figure out essentially needle in the haystack type of things, and then really looking at patterns that that might help inform us as to, uh, you know, what what could be coming next or, you know, what, what do things look like now and what do variants of that look like now is, is really important. So very, very cool. So obviously Risk IQ focuses on, uh, you know, helping companies, you know, secure their environments, mitigate, um, you know, large uh, attacks and so forth. Um, you know, for people that don't live in the security domain, and, and this is probably really relevant to you, because like you said, that wasn't your first space. Um, you know, can you give us some sense of, you know, what are these, 
really big attacks, really big breaches look like? You know, sometimes we, we just hear the headlines of them and, you know, stuff got stolen or but, – but what do they look like in, in real life? Give folks a sense so they get a, an idea of like, oh, oh okay, this is, this is how big a problem it is, why it's important to understand things at a, at a large scale. Right. So there's two different avenues that I like to think about uh, how things get breached. One is a true vulnerability, a hole in their security program. Uh, that's getting smaller and smaller and, and in a lot of ways. People have stronger firewalls. They have their, their network buttoned down, at least their core network, and we'll get into that a little bit later. They have their core network buttoned down, but on the other side, or at least they think they do, <laughs> I should say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and on the other side is social engineering, and that actually ends up being a, a pretty strong attack vector. So through, uh, you know, someone will set up a... Um, a phishing page or whether it's a social media profile attack or whether it's a uh, whether it's a, a just a generic scam spear phishing whatever it happens to be some social media attack goes and uh, help and identifies uh, a target um, or they just you know spray the internet with all their with the, these large scale attacks but then they'll find that person they will then harvest their credentials and then through password reuse which is a very huge vector they'll try to compromise uh, a known valuable web inf- web asset. So that's where I, there's two of these vectors, and we help with both. So one of the one side is help, we help you know what you what you don't know about your network, or at least get everything that you need, do you think you know about your network into one place, and help you identify these uh, these sec- um, general vul- um, vulnerabilities, and help you uh, identify and mitigate some of them. And on the other side, the people that are pretending to be you or attacking your company, attacking your in- um, infrastructure from the social engineering aspect. We also help you identify social media impersonations, phishing, domain infringement, uh, and rogue mobile apps that are pretending to be you, which is which is just as critical as the uh, attack surface infrastructure. Right. So, right. but yeah, so that's what a so in a on the vulnerability side, if you have a vulnerable web component, it can uh, allow for remote code execution. Uh, a lot of interactive web pages that we see today, a lot of um, services that we're we're using. They highlight the interactions that that users can uh, perform on the on their websites or their their APIs or whatever it happens to be, and these are these are critical functions to a modern internet. But at the same time, it allows if they're not completely buttoned down and completely protected, what we end up seeing is is these remote code executions allow people to get in through some through the mouse hole, if you will. And it's like that's that's the that's one of the major attacks. Yeah, and then on the other side, of course, you know, as soon as someone clicks on the wrong link, as soon as, you know they can, their computer can get exploited, or if they um, if they willingly pro- provide credentials to someone who's fraudulently impersonating someone else, then they're they're also uh, they're also at risk. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's when you when you combine together the fact that, uh, you know, you mentioned well, if you've got sort of your core buttoned up and locked down, uh, you know, they're really isn't a perimeter anymore. Uh, you know, that, that's been breaking down for a long time. We no longer just sort of have client server patterns. The, the, you know, the perimeter sort of gone away. And, mm-hmm. and, and we're so, I guess we're so programmed and conditioned to just be like, you know, the internet's everywhere. Everything we interact with is sort of technology. So we're not, you know, as, as users, if you will, we're not kind of on guard. We're just assuming that, you know, somebody smart has figured out, oh, okay, make this computing environment safe for me. Or, uh, you know, I clicked on this link and it seemed to just work. So it must be good. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you started to highlight that, um, you know, kind of the old things we're, we're getting very, very good at the newer things where there are no perimeters and, and people don't necessarily always know who they're interacting with. The fakes are getting better and better. Um, mm-hmm. obviously makes your job harder and harder. It does, especially when we're talking about a you know BYOD, uh, bring your own device. That's a really uh, risky proposition for any company. Yeah. Now they say, well, you work you work remotely two days a week. Uh, we don't want to buy you a laptop and a desktop. Why don't you use your your laptop at home, um, and we'll make sure that you have the proper VPN. Well, right. all of a sudden, that laptop that's being used to go uh, go shop the you know do shop on e-commerce sites is compromised. And now there's a hole into your, into your network. Right. right. Um, so, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously there, there are vulnerabilities, uh, you know, we see, um, you know, CVEs and, and bugs and stuff that get out there. As you look at, as you guys are looking at trends and so forth, are you seeing that, that the newer attacks, the things that are leading to these breaches are, you know, kind of new all the time, or are we seeing just 
variants of old attacks or is it just, you know, it's old attacks and people have figured out, oh, okay, this is the latest struts vulnerability and nobody's patched it. I mean, like, it, where are we kind of on the spectrum in terms of stuff that's really new? Oh, that's a problem. We've never seen it. And, oh, we've seen various of this, but it's just people haven't kept up with, with having to secure it and patch it and, and do the things they have to do. Yeah, I'll start with the operations side of things. You know, taking the time to to patch is is costly. You know, yeah. every time you upgrade a, upgrade to the new version of some library, you don't know if it's compatible. Did they did they make sure that every single uh, method they have is is also present in this new file? And a lot of times it isn't, and and so you have you'll have issues. Maybe the signature changed just a little bit, and now you have a problem deploying your code. And and so the companies take a risk. They say, well, do I want to break my business? By deploying this new jar that may not be 100% compatible, or do I take the risk and, uh, or do I mitigate the risk and upgrade? So that that becomes a problem. The other side of it that you mentioned is like what's so these core sort of vulnerabilities uh, appear all the time. These are the the core you know what we call common vulnerabilities and exploit CVEs. But the issue that we we're also seeing is around. The like our the new thing that we're seeing is what we call what we're calling mage cart or some others are calling form jacking or or something like that. So th- this is scraping web pages. This is not necessarily new, but it's at, at a much larger scale now. So what the what they'll do is they'll compromise the web server. Uh, they'll add some code either to the web server or to a third party, and that um, that small piece of JavaScript will then scrape the scrape the forms on that website. And send that uh, all that new information, all the information you've entered in about yourself, including your credit card information, your CDV2, your little security code on the back of your credit card, all that will be sent off to another uh, a command and control or ex, uh, exfiltration server somewhere else. That's that's more or less a that's an, a technique that we've observed since 2014, uh, and we've been tracking that, and it's grown in popularity for the past oh, eight months or so. So we're seeing that more and more. Um, Several thousand domains every day uh, get compromised, and or excuse me, every week get compromised. It's it's still, but other than that, from the outside, you know, it we we've seen a, a as browsers get locked down and are, are more secure, we've seen exploit kits sort of die off. That was that was a huge thing um, a little bit over, over a year ago. So from uh, about twenty, uh, let's say, yeah. 2010 to about a year ago, exploit kits were were still very popular uh, popular mechanisms to to harvest or to um, exploit uh, computers, but it's no longer uh, no longer a popular mechanism. Yeah. But having said that, there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of opportunities. Every time a new exploit comes out, the, you, we may see a resurgence of these exploit kits yep. that will go in and, and attempt to take over uh, take over laptops and or, you know home computers and and uh, even your employees, uh, workstations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, um, you know, your, your background is in data science. Uh, part of that is, is, you know, there's, there's all sorts of new things that are evolving, uh, whether they're called machine learning or data science or artificial intelligence where, uh, you know, the, the challenge with, uh, like you mentioned with patching with just, you know, operations, keeping up with a lot of things changing is, you know, how, how fast can the, the people, the humans, the operations kind of deal with this, um, where are we seeing, uh, you know, AI and ML become relevant sort of from an ops and security perspective? And, and, you know, what are some of the things that if people are interested in this space, maybe there are some trends they should be paying attention to? Uh, that's, an, that's an interesting question. So what we found is that it's, it's highly effective on these large scale attacks, okay. but it takes time to ramp up. The, the issue that we have with machine learning in general is that it takes time to collect enough training data. So as new, new attacks come up, uh, it takes, you know, you, you start off with a signature, start collecting some information based on maybe just keywords, based on just a, uh, single strings within a, within a binary. But that, um, that takes time to start collecting and labeling that training data. Then building the model, start with something simple, of course, and build up. So everyone, you know, everyone loves deep learning. Well, actually, it's kind of, it's, it, but it doesn't solve the problem necessarily. You need a huge amount of data, a huge amount of labeled training data to do that. And the... Uh, for new, hot, like up and coming uh, events, it just doesn't uh, it doesn't work as fast as it needs to. It also takes a long time to retrain these models, and so that's something that that um, you all, we also need to take care of. Is you we have to constantly be retraining these models because as as the attacker migrates their techniques or or shifts their techniques um, relatively slowly, what we see is 
uh, we need to, our models need to stay in lockstep. And also we need to see the, these things from multiple angles. So it's also not something that you can do with just one model. You need multiple models looking at these from different angles. Right. Um, so as far as trends in, inside of machine learning that would that are that people should be paying attention to, it's there's a lot of active learning that people need to look into. So how do you like if you're going to present a, a sub, sub, subject matter expert with a training example, which one is the best one to to uh, to uh, to give them to uh, to classify your or to improve your model? Right. So a lot of people think about like, well, it's the one that the model is never the model knows nothing about. It could be the one that's a near miss or near hit, something that the model is not very sure of. Uh, and there's other techniques like that, too. Right. Right. Help. Yeah. And yeah, I, I know you wrote uh, and I, I have a thing, a, a pointer in the show notes. Um, you wrote a really good piece that said, hey, um, <clears throat> while there's a lot of buzz around uh, ML and, and some of these tools, you know, you almost have to to treat them as like a junior engineer as you're bringing them in. And I think you really highlighted that. It's, you know, you've got to go find data sets that they can go train on um, mm-hmm. those data sets don't become irrelevant, but like you said, as, as variants of these attacks come in or new variants come in, you, you almost have to start over sometimes. So it's, I think it's important that while we're hearing a lot about like AI ops and some of these new things, you have to put them in the right context. So you set the right expectations for you know, what's it potentially going to do for you. And at the same time, realizing like, this is also probably the best way to deal with the scale of these problems at the same time, right? So it's, it's uh, asking for patience, but also realizing like it's, it can potentially be really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, think about the the first game uh, AlphaGo ever tried to play. It probably did a terrible job. Right. And it just learned over and over and over again after mil- uh, millions of iterations to get to the point where it was an expert in the in the field. And so that's where we are now. And sometimes these things like data breaches, it's like, how do I detect a data breach? Well, my, what's my training data for that? There's how many data breaches? There's not that many compared to the number of games an AlphaGo machine learning algorithm can play. So the algorithms that you need are, are significantly different to handle much smaller data sets or much not smaller data sets necessarily, but uh, fewer training examples. Yeah. yeah, that's a really big, a really big deal. Um, a lot of the stuff that we also see is something that we've that was a, a hot topic a few years ago was uh, semi-supervised learning. That's a that's a topic that is also gaining traction again, uh, which I, I think is amazing where you're using the unlabeled data in addition to the labeled data, the stuff you don't know about, you don't know how to, w- whether it was an attack or not, but you put it in there to, so that your decision boundaries uh, become more crisp and, uh-huh. and more accurate. And so that's a, that's a really big deal with machine learning. And people should, I, I would love to see more research on that side. Right. On the, on, now, and applying that. Yeah. Now, now there are, uh, you know, obviously there are, you know, vulnerability databases. There are things, uh, Risk IQ I know, provides a number of things around, um, you know, making sure that you can tap into databases that, that keep track of signatures and, and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. But like w- when you mention, um, you know, breaches, uh, you know, somebody breaches, a, a, um, you know, an airline or a credit card or a retailer or so forth. Like even though the number of those maybe isn't huge, it, does does the way that they're attacked, does that somehow get out into these public domains so researchers can look at it? Or how, how do we, you know, like what, what's the mechanism say behind the scenes where you say like, there's not a lot of them, um, but how do we learn from them as opposed to sort of, you know, rid- ridiculing them Oh, you didn't do the right security things, but like how does learning come out of those breaches so that they can, they can get into these tools and models? Yeah. Hindsight's 2020, right? We, right. we know what we should have done, but it's always hard to know what we should be doing. Uh, the, so for the security breaches, they, a lot of them have to be publicly disclosed. disclosed. California law requires it, so that this is something that we um, that a lot of people will track uh, in order to, to develop their training data. Now, what we need is also the state of their system at that point in time, and that's what Risk IQ provides. Is, it, was we provide you a historic snapshot of your system when you you know uh, so that you can look back and see what what took place at that point in time. What we can do at that point is then take the the publicly disclosed breaches and take indicators that we've developed against our, our historic data set and then model what uh, a new sec- what the potential is for a new security breach. And that's really what people want to know. They don't and, and we can give them high, le- high level indicators and things like that, but that's that's a, for us that's a little bit further down the line. Sure. Um, it, this is but it, that's what you would have to do. You you know in order to sort of correlate these things back together every because every breach is unique. Typically, there's a lot of there's some commonality, but not um, not complete overlap. You'll have to you have to do a lot more investigation on this. And and t- 
typically a lot of com- a lot of companies will not disclose how they were breached. Right. So for a security researcher, you either have to have inside information, uh, you know, friends of friends that that are, were involved in the analysis, or um, you just have to infer based on what you know about their infrastructure. Right. Right. In order right. to protect your own, and that's where a lot of our a lot of this space, this attack surface management, comes into play. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So we, we, we want transparency, but sometimes uh, we're, we're not going to get all of it. Uh, obviously, it yeah. makes it, it makes it challenging. So let me ask you this. Um, I, I know we've, we've talked about a lot of topics, and, and obviously this is something that we could go into a lot of depth around. Um, what are some of those things as, as you talk to companies who, uh, you know, maybe there's uh, maybe there's a CISO who's coming into a new opportunity, a new situation, or a company's been, you know, recently breached, whether it was public or not. Like, what are some of the, the kind of the common things you, you use for people, just in terms of, you know, good hygiene or, uh, you know, things that they ought to be, you know, adopting now to to make sure they're better prepared, not completely secure, obviously, because you can never be, but like better prepared. What what are some of the common things that people can do that have kind of immediate impact. So people continue to invest in those things or just common hygiene things that you find um, people should use as a checklist. Yeah, that's, there's a long checklist. Uh, there, there, there definitely is. So, uh, and I think that it's, it's difficult to, to know what to start with. I mean, uh, when I would ask a new CISO, it would, it would be like, what are their, you know, let's start with their priorities. How are, uh, where, where are their fears? The challenge that we have um, that we see is, is it, sometimes it, it's, uh, the things that they don't think about that, that we need to help educate them on. So things like, well, I'm really secu- I'm really worried about my endpoint security. I want to make sure that every one of my workstations is is, is um, fully protected. Well, that's very difficult for for a single a single endpoint solution. Well, I want to make sure that my firewall is is fully secure. Well, are you also considering like a, a data exfiltration through DNS? It, does that you know that's very difficult to to deal with. Um, DDoS attacks and so on and so forth. And when we get to the point where we're, we're talking about, well, do you actually know what your entire footprint looks like? Well, do you actually have a full picture of everything that you own and all the attack vectors that, or all the places where people could uh, potentially breach your system? And then, then it kind of gets, and we get into that conversation of like, it's, it's, you have to know what you, what you own. You have to know what, what will impact you first um, before we can, before you can move on. If you don't, because it's that little server that no one updated that's going to be the easiest place to attack. Gotcha. And a lot of, and that's where a lot of our, a lot of security or excuse me, a lot of hackers are, are that's where they're approaching this or a lot of threat actors are approaching this is looking for that, the, the low hanging fruit. You know, there's also just basic hygiene. There's making sure that your, your SSL certs are up to date, making sure that they're not expiring tomorrow. Uh, that's always a, a risk because as soon as that SSL cert expires or um, then everyone who visits your website will have that, that uh, security risk uh, notification based on uh, from Google saying that this is not a no longer um, a, a valid certificate, something you really need to take care of. Domain expiration. This has happened where people are they they let their domain expirations lapse, and all of a sudden they're being registered or attempted to be registered by some someone who uh, is unauthorized to do that. Transfer setting your domains up so that they, you have transfer prohibited. So that they can't be transferred to a threat actor, DNS hygiene. This is a threat that we're seeing more and more these days. Is um, something we're, um, it, that's called DNS hijacking. So we they'll start with uh, let's say you have an external service. You'll have a, a a host that's in your network or in your footprint, and that'll have a C name to this this uh, this external certif- service that you rely on the external service laps for whatever reason, you no longer use it, you no longer. Uh, and now all of a sudden someone comes along, finds that service is lapsed. They register it in that name because it's available. And then they are now, and now your customers are getting funneled or your customers or employees are getting funneled into that, into that uh, uh, compromised service, which is a really big deal. Yeah. Uh, potentially leaking uh, confidential information. So, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like, there are still, like you said, there's there's a long laundry list of things that, that you absolutely need to be doing. But, right. you know, a lot of them are still, um, you know, very basic level things, not not that they're basic capabilities, but, you know, uh, making sure you, you're rotating certs, making sure the certs are still mm-hmm. valid, making sure you are controlling DNS, all these sort of common basic uh, sort of fundamental things have to have to be top of mind all the time. Absolutely. And it's it's def- it's difficult to keep track of it. A lot of people, are, you know, they start off. We say, "Well, how many how many uh, domains do you think you have?" Oh, I don't know, 
50? And it's like, well, what if it was 5,000? Like, what would you, you know, what would that, how would that impact your, your decision on whether or not to, to start investing in the external, in your external security or your outward, your inward facing security rather than your outward facing security? So what would that do? And, and so that ju- just really shifts their mindset because it's, it's not the, it's not the servers that you maintain every day. It's um, sometimes it is, you know, sometimes your main website will be defaced. That has happened to, to many people throughout history and, or throughout the history of the internet. Um, but that's, yeah, you have to, you have to account for the things you don't see or that you don't know about, or you're not managing, especially when the, when you have this siloed, the siloed operations teams at these huge companies, it's very difficult to have like a single consistent, accurate, constantly updated uh, system of record. Right. Right. Yeah. No. I, and I, and I think, you know, as, as we've talked about throughout this um, you know, when you start having, um, you know, companies take advantage of innovation and sort of allowing shadow IT to, uh, to, to blossom and, you know, go out and, and do innovative things. You've got a perimeter, which has sort of gone away. You've got, uh, you know, very motivated hackers and so forth. It does become more and more difficult. And it's, it's really important to make sure that, um, you know, not only are you doing the, the best you can with the hygiene, but also start, uh, you know, take advantage of some of these tools that will track things for you, will will automate some things for you. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a space yeah. where, where Risk IQ uh, brings a lot of value and so forth. Um, let me, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and well, the, the other last one I want to mention was, you know, just open port scanning. We do a lot of scanning of the internet through crawling and also through our open port system, looking for exposed databases. Elasticsearch and Redis being the two most uh, easily exploitable uh, once they're exposed. So, you know, that's another situation where people have good intentions. A lot of operations teams have really good intentions. Things fall through the, tr- the cracks and we try to help them identify those things. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, very good. Well, listen, let me uh, let me wrap that up because I know you're very, very busy. Uh, I know we've, we've covered a lot of things and obviously folks will put some other additional things in the show notes for you to follow up on. Um, Adam, real quick, if, if folks want to reach out to you or, uh, you know, maybe what are some of the areas that, that you might be out at events and stuff that people uh, might be able to talk about this a little bit more with you? Sure. I, I'm, uh, I'm well, this year it's very difficult because like I'm deciding between going to KDD in, uh, in Alaska or Black Hat since they're the same week. But I'll be in one of those too. Uh, if we want, to, if you want to discuss, uh, you can also hit me up uh, um, by email adam.hunt at riskiq.net or LinkedIn. Anything you, if you want to talk more about this, I'd be happy to. Very cool. Very very cool. Well, folks, obviously this is a, a space that uh, you know continues to. Unfortunately, you know we, we continue to see breaches and attacks, but uh, uh, it's it's good to have folks like Adam and others who are you know applying more than just human instincts to this. We're applying, uh, beginning to apply more uh, knowledge of big data sets and, and analytics and, uh, and you know, machine learning and so forth to it. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Adam, thank you so much for the time today for Adam and myself. Uh, folks, thank you for listening. Thank you for telling a friend. Thank you for writing the show on iTunes. And we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 